All right, everyone, welcome back into another fantasy golf video. Going to be breaking down the Memorial Tournament here for you guys, giving you guys the top picks and bets, talking about DFS lineup construction and just all the best values that we have, whether it be betting or DFS wise. Let's go in and get into it. So this week's tournament is a little bit different than last week's tournament, just because this is going to be a limited field event, which is annoying. I've been over this a bunch. Kind of sucks that they've been doing this to us. Part of the appeal is having a cut. That's part of the appeal of DFS and just betting. It's fun. It makes it more worthwhile. So the one thing that's worth noting about this week's tournament is that it will have a cut. The top 50 players will make the cut and all players within 10 strokes of the lead as well after round two. And this is a 70 man field. So that very well could be the whole field. You know, if someone doesn't show up at all, maybe there's a few players that don't make the cut, but I don't exactly like that. Like just make it a cut or make it a no, or no cut event, you know, like just do one or the other. And so for like DFS purposes, that's going to be the most difficult part about this week. And I'll get into that in just a second, but get into the course overview, uh, Mirfield village. We have seen this a bunch. We actually saw it twice in 2020, uh, once for the workday charity open is what they called it. Now, obviously it's the Memorial tournament presented by workday, uh, but they played it back to back weeks for the most part, the players that played well in the first event did play well again in the second event at that course. They did try to make it a little bit longer uh, the second weekend, but still the same course, right? Uh, so we will be taking a peek at both of those results, which is a little bit different than what I typically would do. Uh, and then still looking back at 2023, 2022, and 2021. It is a longer track, par 72, going to be bent courses. Weather-wise, we're going to have good conditions for the most part. I mean, winds, maybe 15 mile per hour winds, but shouldn't be an issue. And just looking at the past results here, it is a harder scoring track. That we know for sure. It's very difficult to score on this track. So when we're looking at key stats, and the nice thing about this is we know which key stats to look at, is we want to be targeting golfers that are not going to make many mistakes. Now, we have seen over the years that the golfers that are best in toll driving and ball striking are the golfers that are winning and also finishing top 10. We're also the golfers that are more likely to make the cut. The golfers that were not making that many bogeys, but also having a good birdie to bogey ratio. That's what I'm looking at there with the effective birdie to bogey ratio. They're going to be ranking out that well there. And then effective scoring that nine to five stat. That's just ability. It's basically a measure of safety and upside. So we're looking at the best key stats. This, this is not going to surprise anyone in terms of stat fit. Scotty, Xander, Albert, Rory, Connors, Lowry, Keegan. Like those are players that we've been on a bunch already this year, which is why we've had an awesome year and they continue to produce. That's good stuff. In terms of course history here, now, Scotty did miss the cut at this event in 2020 when it was the Workday Charity Open. I, oh, well, you know, that is pretty far removed since then, second, third, 22nd. Like, we know he's going to be good here. Uh, Siwoo Kim, surprising, re surprisingly, has played really well at this track. Jordan Speed has played well. Uh, Patrick Cantlay, Xander popping up in there as well as he typically has been Rory as well. So we are probably going to be looking at those guys. Jason Day, surprisingly, very much hit or miss at this track, a track that he plays a bunch. So uh, I feel like people are going to be talked into him as a play. I think he's more of just a shoulder shrug play as well. Let's go ahead and jump into the golfers that are going to be in the best recent form, which does make me want to bring up a point for you guys, a point that I did call it on Twitter as well earlier on this, this past week. You could just sort by made cuts here and then anyone that's below three just don't play them in cash typically speaking if it's a full cut event now it does get a little bit different with the event that we have this week and again i'll get into that in just a second to talk about that strategy but just a head scratcher but looking at the recent form here obviously scotty xander rory those are the three best players in the world right now uh you know it was funny um a couple of events ago when rory beat xander i'm like all right Roy's the second best for sure. Then Xander wins the next week. I'm like, all right, Xander's back to being the second best in the world. I know like world rankings, he wasn't, but just given the consistency that Xander's had, I mean, 47 straight make cuts, been extremely consistent. I know Roy's won twice now as well. So anyway, you slice it, those three are the best, but then we have Hideki who has been playing great golf, 14 straight make cuts as well. Kamo or Kyle has been playing better recently as well. Eight straight make cuts, multiple top 10 finishes for him. Tommy Fleetwood continues to play well. Oh, Bear's an interesting one. Finally missed the cut at an event, but I mean, that's really the only data point that we, or only bad data point that we have going into him as a play. Lucas Glover, and I think that's the standout one. That's a play we're probably getting into a bunch. Corey Connors as well. Alex Norn was the annoying pick last week, missing the cut. Still a good week. Um, Corey Connors carried for the most part, finishing sixth. That was huge. 
And obviously, Rory playing well as well is huge. But we do have a decent amount of golfers that are kind of slightly discounted that are in good form, like Kirk Kitayama as well. So we do have some plays we can get to. And so, again, just looking at the specialist data, that's just pulling in all the unique characteristics for that week's tournament. And really, what I would say is the most unique about this week's tournament, we could do really rough amount and rough length. Decent amount of rough on the course, but the rough length is typically thick. You could look at harder scoring tracks. You could look at the length and maybe greens as well. And so that could be a way of going about doing it. If you want to look at Jack Nicholas course design players that play best on that. Well, these are the golfers that would then be the best fits for that. Overall, though, I think we're good at just using the specialist data as a good 50-50 decision maker. But if you were just looking at this, we're still getting to Scotty. We're still getting to Rory. We're still getting to Xander and even Kyle Morikawa. That's the difficult part about this week. So let's go ahead and touch on just the strategy for this week. So last week was kind of the first week in which I was a little bit worried about lineup construction. But obviously, everyone else then probably is going to have a tougher lineup, which we saw come to fruition. End up still being a very solid week. Finished second in a showdown on Sunday or on, uh, sorry, on Friday, round two showdown. Probably should have won. That one was a little bit painful. Had Maverick, basically Maverick McNeely, and I think it was Ryan Fox made like 43 feet of putts on their last hole to beat me, which was tilting, but not complained about second place. Good stuff there. Uh, but yeah, continuing a good stretch of golf that we've had this whole season. I think part of the reason as to why we've had such a good season is because we've had a lot of these bad events in these signature events that are supposed to be fun. They're supposed to be better for fans. They're not. They suck. Um, but with these signature events, it's been a lot of no-cut events. And with that, the strategy typically is, what? Hopefully you guys know by now, studs and duds. You know, typically we, we could just blindly make a good build by loading up on the studs on the top end and then just loading up with the duds on the bottom end. And you could probably still do that in some capacity this week. But given the pricing that we are seeing this week, it's much, much more difficult to do. And also, we are getting a couple of discounted plays that shouldn't be that cheap. You'll see Corey Connors is going to be one of those plays. Definitely too cheap. Lucas Glover is probably someone we're looking at as well. But it is much more difficult to do that this week. And because there is a slight cut, that does change the strategy a little bit. And we know the top three plays are Scotty, Rory, and Xander. Now, given Xander's pricing, he's probably going to be the first player into your builds this week just because he's clearly mispriced in comparison to those two. I would argue... Those three should probably all be 12K at least because they've all been that, that dominant. I mean, Rory was last week as well. So that's the difficult part this week is that we do probably want to be trying to fit two of those players into our builds, but it's super difficult to do this week. And again, most people just weren't doing that, even though they know in 2024, that's how you are successful in these limited field events, in these events where, you know, 80 percent of the field makes the cut or 100 percent of the field makes the cut we can't exactly do that this week and that is going to be the difficult part and i'll show you guys a little bit more as to why that is but again this is probably the most difficult pricing wise it's been maybe ever to make a good build which i'm low-key kind of excited about like it, it kind of gets repetitive you know you know the strategy to be successful you keep doing it everyone's having good results this is one where it's like, all right, we kind of got to work for it. Kind of a little bit fun like that. So let's go ahead and get into kind of what I'm looking at this week. So the top end plays are all going to be coming from the high tier range, which is going to be that 9K and up pricing tier. And really, it's just on paper. It's very easy. Again, there's no bad data points for the top three. It's Xander. It's Roy. It's Scotty. Again, I'm probably going to be going more with Xander just because he's the cheapest of the three. And those three are clearly the best. Now, I know recently it's been more Rory and Scotty, but at the same time, more long term, it's Ben Xander, you know, 47 straight make cuts. Now, I know Scotty's made 37, whatever. It doesn't matter which way you slice it, right? Like you, you want to be ending up on one of those three, which one you want to end up on. I don't, I mean, obviously it's going to matter in retrospect, but in terms of like predicting it, it's tough to say. And so it could almost be a situation in which whichever player comes in lower owned, lowest owned, that's the player you want to get to. Now, I still think people, people have figured it out that they should just be rostering Scotty at this point. And that didn't occur until like four events ago for Scotty, where it was super nice. He was very cheap, not being as high owned as he is. We have recently seen kind of the fantasy golf community adjust to that when we are getting these elite options like Rory last week, people are just starting to go in on them a little bit more. And so I'd imagine it's going to be Scotty, then Xander, then Rory. So that's the conundrum that we're in. Again, I haven't really decided which of the two I want to be on, or if we can even fit two of them into our builds, but that's going to be the goal for now. I'm putting in Xander, but again, all three of those plays are just elite options. From there, I think it's going to be Colin Morikawa. And so again, I kind of mentioned I'm looking at this on the back end where I am including the 2020 results 
from the workday, Charity Open. And Colin Morikawa did win that week. So he does have good course history. I'll just have this pulled up so you guys can see who else, you know, played well that week because I'm not exactly popping it up on the cheat sheet here for guys stick sticking to the last four results, just as an FY. But still good results here for Colin Morikawa. I mean, a bad result two years ago at this track, but still a second place mix in there with the victory. I mean, just really good stuff there from Kyle Morikawa. And we look at it, guys, over his past six results, four of them have been top 10 or better. He is knocking on the door. And what better sight for him to kind of finally break through again than this one? And so for me, the question is, do we take the risk this week and plug in Kyle Morikawa with Xander, you know, the, the cheapest of the leak offers we can get to? And I do think, again, I think it's those three in the top end, Scotty, Rory, Xander, then it's Colin Morikawa, and then I think there's a whole separate tier as well. And so I am toying around with the idea of getting to Colin Morikawa a little bit more as well. But again, that is the conundrum that we are in this week. I'm going to do it for now for the first like build purposes. But after that, I mean, you could go with Obear, but now we got to deal with Obear missing the cut in his last event. Now, it was the PGA Championship. I do think we can kind of just write that off. Didn't exactly have his A game go in there. It's kind of okay. Data-wise, we still look at it, guys, still in the seventh best recent form, still the third best staff, still the sixth best specials, still someone that you want to be getting to. A player that I will be having some exposure to is going to be win, or sorry, is going to be Hideki at his price tag of 9K. That's just a little bit too cheap for how well he's been playing, relatively speaking. I, I don't think people are really giving him that much credit for how well he's played this season. It's kind of going under the radar. And so the issue is that in a normal week like this this limited field event this event where a lot of players are going to make the cut we typically wouldn't want to get to a player like Hideki too much because we'd really want to be doing studs and duds but this is kind of a unique week this week with how it's priced now betting wise I will say it's it's probably just going to be if I could honestly get a market of uh, Scotty Rory or Xander at plus money I don't know if that's out there I would probably just bet that because I do think it's going to be those three I could toy around with Morikawa Hideki and then I'll get into Corey Connors in a second. Could, could toy around with those guys as well. But Hideki hasn't has had the best results here. He did have a T22, though, in 2020 when it was the workday. So not terrible results as well, like good enough. And that's kind of my worry is that we might begin more of a floor week for Hideki. Typically, he does not produce good results the week before major. He does like to get reps in before major. So I actually think if he just does decent this week, we're probably going to be looking at him more next week and so i think i'm off on hideki then after that the next best play is actually Corey connors guys Corey connors i don't really get the pricing on him he is what makes this week kind of difficult because he is clearly mispriced he is clearly someone that we should be going out of our way to roster this week the only concern from him is that miscut at this event last year but the nice thing about connors is that we have seen a lot of recent upside from him so i think we can kind of bank on him making the cut like he's done in 22 straight events and last week six you know 26 13 to 11th now we probably need to get more of that top 15 place finish but at this price he does have that safety and upside does have those ohio connections as well which you know never a bad thing to have those good vibes going went to school here eighth best specialist course history again could be a little bit better but not not alarming recent form ninth best in the field fifth best stat fit just at this price guys it's someone that we need to be going out of our way to roster and so you can see this is already looking like a great build right but that's that's again the issue is that in a week like this, we typically would do studs and duds. And that's just, that might not be the option this week. We might have to do more of a fair and balanced approach. But from there, I feel like we went through like the clear cut plays. Let's go in again to some other decent plays. So Alex Norn is an interesting play this week. Obviously coming in off of a missed cut last week. Just didn't exactly have his A game going. Um, he might fall under the criteria of everyone was saying he was a good play last week. Maybe he finally heard that noise, that chatter. I honestly think that was a thing, guys. Just real quickly, like um, when the fantasy golf space was like growing is when these these players like Alex Norton saw themselves getting a lot of chatter that they they knew it and they kind of shut down a little bit. Maybe maybe that is what happened with them last week. I mean, not terrible. 78th place finish. It's like the I keep going back to Jaeger with this stuff where with Jaeger, it was either going to go one way or the other. He was either going to miss the cut or he's going to make a victory. And actually he ended up doing both. That could happen with Norton. I mean, this is a good course for him it, it's he hasn't had the best results here, but it wouldn't be surprising to see him have a good week here. Um like it, it's, he's a good bounce back candidate. I don't think we need to go crazy with it though. But really, the two plays that are standout plays at their prices is going to be Shane Lowry and Tony Fino. Both of those guys are going to be long off the tee. Look at effective scoring, both top ten in the field. You look at ball striking, both top ten in the field. You look at total driving, both top twenty in the field. And then effective birdie bo bogey ratio, very solid there. Both have been making a bunch of cuts. Both have good results at this. Sorry, at this tournament in the past, like they are kind of ideal plays as well. And so again. 
that's still promoting more of the fair and balanced approach, which I don't like. Like I'll probably play one of those two, not both of those two in my builds. After that, we still have Keegan Bradley and Siwoo Kim that are both looking good. Now, Siwoo Kim is someone that typically is a little bit hit or miss, but he has been playing extremely well at this track. Fourth, 13th, 9th, 18th. Great stuff there. Yes, he's coming in off of a 56th place finish and a missed cut. Besides that, after that, 16th, 13th, 18th, 30th, 17th, 17th and 6th. Okay, he's still the ninth best staff fit. Has tremendous course history. It wouldn't be shocking to see him play well this week. This is a course that obviously suits his eye. And then Keegan. Keegan has just been playing extremely well. He probably will be lower owned than he should be this week. He is someone I think you guys can get to if that is going to be the case. But besides that, we don't want to be going crazy with it. Again, typically speaking, these weeks we do want to be doing studs and does because a majority of the time, cheap plays are going to make the cut and you pair those up with guys that are going to finish top 10. That's huge. But one player I don't think I want to miss out on this week is still going to be Lucas Glover. I say still because I feel like I've been recommending Lucas Glover for about the past seven events he's been in, which has been pretty darn solid. Uh, he, he continues to be just a little bit too cheap. And so he continues to be someone that kind of fits the bill in uh, a lot of builds because you're in a cheap make cut that can provide top 20 upside. That's what he presents this week. And, you know, if he's someone that's continuing to play good golf, we see a bunch of top 20 finishes mixed in there. Maybe he finds himself into contention on a more limited field event. Like, guys, think about it. The last two weeks probably would have hit an outright winner if the field was this size. Would have hit a first-round leader, still tilted about David Skins, hurting the first-round lead from Sam Burns last week. That was annoying. But he is someone like DFS-wise. I think we just need to be playing. Strong staff fit. You know, one missed cut at this event. It's kind of okay. I do expect him to make the cut this week. Just playing too good of golf recently to really doubt him. If he burns me this week, it's kind of like, oh, well, he's been the correct play for several weeks now. I'm kind of okay with that. And so, again, lineup path-wise, he is someone that I am getting to. First look build, and I will be running out the lineup builder with this as well to see what it's telling us to do. But he's a good play. Now, from there's where it gets difficult. Like Chris Kirk, someone we could potentially play. Austin Eckroad, it's been a little bit hit or miss, but he's someone that I do expect to be on this week. Andrew Putnam had a fourth place finish at this event. Maybe we're looking at him. Adam Shank was decent. Um, you know, all fine plays. Lee Hodges is really the one that sticks out to me the most, though, at his price, uh, 6.5. Again, we're trying to find some good cheap value. He seems to be that guy for us this week. Lee Hodges, 12th place finish at this event last year. He's also had two straight top 12 finishes on the PGA Tour, uh, 24th, missed cut, and then 58th, 61st, 94th, 26th, 35th. So for the most part, he's been playing solid golf. In an event where, yes, we do need to worry about the cut, but at the same time, we don't. He's someone I think we can be looking at. Like, if he misses the cut at this this price, like, who cares? You know what I mean? Um, and the fact that he has played well at this event in the past, I like that. That's encouraging. And so he's someone we can be looking at this week as well at that price tag. And then, again, kind of the, the tough part about this week is that the values that we have this week are not that great. Like, Davis Thompson – Fine bounce back candidate this week. Uh, if you guys wanted to play him, you could. And the fact that he was 40% owned last week in cash, he's probably not going to be that high owned this week because he got burned by or because he burned a lot of people. But really, one value play that I keep coming back to is kind of Taylor Pendrith. He is someone that when you look at his results on longer tracks, those have been some of his you know, best results and one of his victories. And so if we're looking at a value, trying to find a reason to play someone at a cheap price, like that would be Taylor Pendrith for me. So I think we kind of got a good value range here. And I think we do have kind of a good first look build. Like we could go Taylor Pendrith here. We could maybe just go with more of what I see as a shoulder shrug play here in this price range. I would love to get to Siwoo Kim. We can't do that. So like Jaeger is fine. He was just fine. Like Kurt Kitayama is the play that I probably like the most in this range. So kind of okay with that. So let's go ahead and show you guys the nine to five lineup builder. And I do want to talk about some of my favorite outright bets and then we're getting out of here. But just a quick reminder, if you guys like the tools that you are seeing this video, head on over to nine to five sports.com. They're available on the website for just $10 a month. And I'll give you access to actually the full website tools again, just for $10 a month. Take advantage of that. All right. So I'm just going to run it here, giving it, you know, three data points to go off of. I just rounded these up here uh, to their whole number. So it's probably going to spit out. I'm, I'm assuming Xander, but we'll see. So going to generate it. I'm kind of, I'm very curious actually to see what the lineup builder tells us this week. And so this does, I mean, man, again, guys, we would normally not run out a lineup like this on this type of event, this limited field event, but given the pricing that we have, we might actually have to change that strategy now. And especially with it, with some players missing the cut, like this could end up being a very good build. We got Xander, Cordy Connors, you know, two players that seem like lineup starting points. And if you were going to go with a fair and balanced approach, Shane Lowry, Tony Finau, Sue Kim, and Lucas Glover would all be players that you would be ending up on as well. And so, yeah, that sucks. That, I mean, that's a very good build. But again, 
that's the conundrum that we are in this week. And just real quickly, just to show you guys here, you can get to like Rory if you wanted to. Scotty is more difficult to get to, but like we could go Pendrith here, take out Morikawa. And then from there, you know, we're probably having to get off of Connors. And maybe, maybe you're worried about Connors winning upside. You could easily then just go to like Siwoo Kim. And, and obviously you wouldn't love that too much, but it, it's not terrible. You can make that work. And obviously if you're if you're trying to get to Scotty, it does become more difficult. You are probably going maybe a little bit too studs and dudsy. Davis Thompson would probably be the play then. So it does become more difficult when you are trying to fit Scotty and Xander into a build together, but still not a terrible build, especially if all of them make the cut. And then just real quickly, we are getting some betting odds, guys. And again, you, I could argue that you should just do the top three golfers here. I mean, you can get Scotty at 3.6 to one. Don't mind that. So if you just bet on the top three, you are still getting a, a profit. We have Xander and Rory as well. Nine to one odds. That's pretty good. From there, it's tough not to love Corey Connors at 55 to one. It almost is priced that way, I think, to get some action on that. Uh, Kyle Morikawa at 14 to one. Again, I don't know how much of winning upside he has. Shane Lowry at 75 to one on FanDuel is okay. And then lastly, like Lucas Glover at 125 to one on points bet does tickle my fancy a little bit. Maybe a better like top 20 bet for him or something like that. Um, but again, I just think we're rolling with those top three players. But again, guys, that's going to be all for today's video. Make sure to give a like and subscribe to the channel. If you guys want access to any of the tools that you saw in this video, head on over to 95sports.com. Again, just available for $10 a month. Thanks for watching, everyone. Good luck this week. We have the U.S. Open tomorrow. So be on the lookout for that. It's going to be some good stuff there. Hopefully, we have a good week this week. Fingers are crossed. Pricing's good. Good luck this week. And as always, let's keep cashing.